You are interviewing me, right? Uh, no, I thought you were interviewing me. <laughs> well, do you have a book out? Uh, no, I don't have a book out, no. Well, I've got a book out, you see. That's why I want you to interview me. <laughs> oh. Right? So have you... you read it? Um, well, yes, I have, actually. You have? Yes, I, I didn't want to spoil it by reading it, but I did read it. <laughs> um, and I, I actually very much enjoyed it, and I genuinely mean that, okay. because it, yes. it's very well written. I have openly advocated for you to write about me. Because I think that if Michael Lewis writes about you, then you're set for life. And it means that you're pretty interesting and have changed the world. For all you know, I'm gathering string right now. Yes. But right now, this is happening and right now. And I guess now. he did write a note. While you're complaining about it not happening, <laughs> yes, it's happening. Yes, that is happening. happening. Okay. And okay. you don't even know it. That's... We're doing it, and you don't even feel it. <laughs> I've been meaning to say this to you since I read the book the first time, that as a, someone who's been writing for 20 years, it makes me a little sick. <laughs> that you knocked it out of the park oh, please. on the first please, attempt. Please. Um, and so I would ask with both admiration and a bit of despair, how did this happen? <laughs> well, uh, you know, my, in my, uh, I started up uh, at my day job uh, as, Which as, is, a, as an actor. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, has always been a, a one that was just based mm -hmm. on pure and utter instinct where actually a lot is expected of you, but you don't have to show anybody what it is. <laughs> I mean, you just, you have to be mm -hmm. attracted to it, and you have to have a passion of what you're doing, but you don't have to explain it. Right. You don't have to, you don't have to talk about it. There's no real work that you have to do, mm -hmm. that you have to show. Okay. You just get to come up, and whoever it is you're working with, they'll give you a bunch of direction, and you say, yeah, 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 oh, look, look, just watch this. Oh, Jen. <laughs> You have a new book called The Mother of Black Hollywood. What makes you the mother of black Hollywood? <laughs> That's an easy one. I am the mother of black Hollywood. <laughs> it's simple. I've been everybody's mom. I played Tupac. Oh my God, here we go, y'all. You know, Taraji P. Henson. Uh, Yes, Tina Turner. Y'all tell me. <laughs> Gabrielle uh, Union's mother. Gabrielle Union's mother-in-law. You know, it goes Kadeem Hardison and Panther. Uh, I've done 68 movies, and I think that uh, uh, I, I think probably out of those 68, I might have played 40 mothers. Excellent. You know, the idea of space is up there somewhere. And although I wouldn't call this a book about space, um, it takes place in the exploration of space and the people that choose as their mission in life to go be, whatever that show was, to go beyond, what was that science? Star Trek. Thank you. Right, the space show. There. <laughs> but. Um, Do you know in my little town of Montreat, I was not allowed to watch that when I was growing up. It because? Was it was cons naughty. To use naughty, naughty, naughty. So I only watched it when I was babysitting, and then I'd watch all the naughty crap I possibly could. But in fact, my fourth grade teacher is here somewhere. You know, my fourth grade teacher, can you imagine that? Um, wait, where are you, Mrs. Skidmore? She's, she's not going to, well, I don't know where she is. Are you up there? Do you, thank you, Mrs. Skidmore. Yeah. And do you know? She is the only teacher I ever had that paddled me, which is why I invited her tonight. You know what I mean? It's kind of cute. But uh, do you remember that? Do you remember when I climbed out the window in the fourth grade? And, it, and, and uh, this was not good because I did not prepare my reentry. I went out the window, and then I realized I had to go all the way to the front of the school, walk back up the steps and down the hall and back into her room. And when I did, there was a yardstick waiting for me. She didn't hit me very hard, but it was... It was um, it was anyway, but she, all kidding aside, and this is very important, never, never underestimate your ability to encourage people. And in the fourth grade, that was the first time anybody ever made me think I could write a story or draw a good picture. If I do the same thing that other DJs do, I'm like, there's nothing unique to my show. It's fun, engaging, people leave happy, but I want people leaving one. I saw Steve Aoki. I saw, that's like Steve Aoki's show. I'll never forget that show because of the unique experience that, that I 
brought to the table. So I always tried all these different things, right? And caking was, was a random, like, fun idea that just, just worked, you know. But then you had pushback. Then I had pushback, yes. But I, you decided, even though you stopped for maybe a minute, yeah. you decided you had pushback not only from people who were going to fill your wallet, you know. But That's from, where, it, like, it really affected me because some of the people that... But you said fellow DJs were also giving you shit. Yeah, that was hard. That was, that was pretty hard. And yet, to this day, it's like one of the... Well, it's here, your brand. Okay, so here's the thing. So what I, I've learned through this is that it's, I think it's a testament to me when I try anything new and there's that much pushback. I need to know if I really believe in what I'm doing, consistency will, will trump all those criticisms. Consistency of what you're doing that you believe in. You have to be consistent to the point where they, they just can't say anything anymore. Like they can try, but it's just, it's like the, the noise isn't as loud. But you realize that's, a, a, that's, really a, loud, that's right? a superpower mindset that humanity doesn't have and needs to be bolstered by books like this. Once Pete wrote Can't Explain, it was quite obvious that he was writing songs from a, a different perspective than all yeah. these others. He was writing, they were writing music for girls. <laughs> Pete was writing music for blokes. Yeah. He was, <laughs> and uh, you know, and I think back of it, and I, I, I do say this thing, you know, that, that, that everyone else was good with rock and roll was music to make love to. Mm -hmm. Well, rock, which what the, who was doing it, it, it and, and still does, was music to fight to. <laughs> 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 and Pete, but, and Pete understood that, and he was yeah. so he's writing these songs for my generation anyway, and anywhere. It's got kind of arrogance about it that isn't there in rock and roll, yeah. and the beat is on the one, you know, because instead of it going, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you get the gist. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I, I became isolated from Peep. Uh, you'd have to read the book. I can't talk too much about it. I did read it, the I'm book. Gonna, I'm going to take... Yeah, but I'm gonna, if I tell them, yeah. then they're going to know the bloody book before they get home. <laughs> Do you want to talk about my career for a while? Well, I'm sure talk about your book. <laughs> you don't want to give away the whole book. From a really young age, like the age of five, you wanted to be an artist. And I was curious as to what, like when you were a child, what that meant to you and how that vision sort of changed over time. Like what, and, and, and what you were doing when you were a kid. Um, I was working in clay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, that's I mean, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I went to this lab school at um, UCLA called UES. It was called UES and now it's called the lab school. And it was all learned by doing, so that all, um, that was my introduction into the world, that this is, that to me was normal, that you, um, when you were learning something, you kind of embraced it with your body and your heart and soul and your mind. And, you know, you made stuff, you enacted cultures. I forget exactly what year it was, but um, we, Thurston and I were coming out here a lot because my parents lived here, and we went to um, a house party in, um, uh, Hermosa Beach, and um, it was, uh, you know, it's a very, like, suburban neighborhood, and we went in the kitchen, and Black Flag were playing in the living room, and Henry was, like, in the kitchen singing, and people were just, like, standing around him, and he was, like, coming up right up to me and, like, <laughs> writhing all over me, and just, ah! and, uh, <laughs> and uh, it left an impression. <laughs> like, I was like, that, this is the best concert I've ever been to. And I, I, like, in New York, they didn't have house parties. Like, maybe there would be a loft, you know, thing. But um, somehow, like, in a kitchen in a suburban ranch house, it's, like, uh, kind of amazing. You better sit down. I can't talk to you when you stand up. Okay. You're too tall. So, Dr. Ruth. That's the best. I've always had these different feelings and different thoughts about sex. And then you had your TV show, and I, I grew up wanting to be Johnny Carson, uh, be like Johnny Carson. Um, and you would be on the show, and no matter how they try to go around you... Wait, I tell you about Johnny Carson. Yes. First time I came to Hollywood, Yes. where you now live, I didn't tell the producer I kept my mouth shut, and I'm sitting there with Johnny Carson. And I say, Mr. Carson, 
you are responsible for the problems Americans have in the bedroom. And Johnny Carson said, how can we? I said, because they stay up at night to watch you and then they are too tired to have sex. He loved me. <laughs> he loved me. One of the also the striking things about the book is your willingness and self-awareness to show the, the pain and terror uh, sometimes of, what, of what, what you're up to, that goes into the prep for what you're up to. And the particular moment that struck me was getting ready for the stage play in, for All the Way. The, the, uh, can you talk a little bit about the, how, how that happened and how it, it accelerated yeah. so much past and, and some of the choices you made that made it tricky? Well, um, recognizing uh, where fans took Breaking Bad, and I mean that literally because it, it opened up and kind of goes out of control and, and you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. It became this avalanche of attention and I was happy for that and at the same time realizing when I knew we were coming to an end, when we were coming at an end, about an, a year and a half before, it was, uh, there was a, a date that we were coming to a close. And so I thought, hmm, the, what has happened to this character, Walter White, has blown up internationally. And so thinking from, my, from a career-wise, I said, I need to get away from television, that's for sure. I can't possibly try to introduce some other character too close to, to that, so uh, I, I want to go do some theater. So I alerted the agency and, and I said, I'm looking for a, a play to do uh, in 2013 when we close the last episode in April, well, our last shoot was April 5th or so, uh, 2013. And my agents called back and said, we found it. It's called All the Way, and it's the story of the first year of the presidency of Lyndon Johnson. And I thought, oh my God, that guy. And uh, <laughs> wow, what a Shakespearean in, in size. And, you know, it's just a big bite. And uh, I read the play and was blown away by it and thought, okay, I, I have to do this. Having grown up African American and civil rights and, you know, hearing from my parents and all that. I feel like a lot of people, and I don't know what this is, and correct me if I'm wrong, don't have a sense of the virility, or the virility isn't quite the right word, but how horrible anti-Semitism was in Europe during that time leading up to that, and how I felt like how easy it must have been to use that against people, even people who maybe unsuspectingly you know, glommed onto it or just let it go. Is that fair? I think it is. I mean, yeah. and part of it is, I mean, this didn't just begin um, during the 20th century. Exactly. This is something that's that I mean. had been gone yeah. for a long time. But I do think yeah. there is a tendency when uh, there are problems is to blame somebody else. Yes. And Marginalization usually, happens over time. Exactly. Usually. The, and, and if you've got, it's, I mean, I think we always try to place the blame not on ourselves, but on somebody else. And if the person um, is different, either in religion or looks or language or whatever, then it's an easy target for that. One of the most important gifts we can give one another, regardless of gender, is the gift of not only being believed, but being believed in. It's so nice, beautiful. Um, can you expand on what you mean by that? Not just having our stories and our narratives believed, but seeing ourselves as not just risks, but as people to be invested in, as ideas to be invested in, with careers to be invested in, with points of view to be invested in. Um, I think that that's one of the biggest struggles uh, that we see is women are constantly feeling like we are this risk factor, that we are ultimately um, not choosable, we're not electable, we're not um, believable. Um, and all of those are deeply tied to ancient, ancient, sexist propaganda and language. I mean, dating back to the Roman Empire. Korean, this book talks a lot about things that people don't like to talk about, race, religion, and politics. You took that big giant leap here. Where did that come from? Um, it's something that we have to talk about because there are problems in those areas that we have to solve. And who are we gonna solve it with? We can't solve it with some people living in, in South America or China. Uh, we have to solve it with 
the people that live in our communities. So we got to talk about these things. We got to get this solved and we got to move on because America is too good an experiment to give up on it now.